Hello, this is Dr. David Wang, and I'm the Cliff and Joyce Penner Chair for the Formation of Emotionally Healthy Leaders at Fuller Theological Seminary. And I also have the honor of speaking at the inaugural um, uh, gathering of the Enlightened Conference. And for me, when I think about the question, why is it important to have a mental health seminar like this? Uh, speaking as a pastor now, um, I think it's about the church being the church about the church existing for others, sharing in the problems of ordinary life, uh, listening, helping, and serving. Our communities are struggling through a mental health pandemic that has only been exacerbated by the COVID pandemic of the last few years. And I'm so grateful for contexts like Enlightenment that can mobilize churches and people and resources to meet this pressing need that we are all facing. It's important to have a mental health seminar in the church because human beings are holistic. We are spiritual, we are psychological, we are biological, and all of this needs to be thought about together in systemic and systematic ways in order for us to grow deeply into the very image and likeness of Jesus. So congratulations for being where you are today, and I pray that it's a rich experience for you. Hi, I'm Gabriel Lowe, and I'm part of the Enlightened Planning Committee. Uh, I think that mental health seminars are important because they help us to be better stewards of our own bodies. Uh, the better that we understand how God made our bodies, uh, the better equipped we are to treat ourselves and others with care and respect. Our brains are incredibly uh, complex, and I don't think we'll ever fully understand them. Uh, but the more that we discover, the more that we find that there are so many resources uh, that we have to be uh, and grow into the kinds of people that God wants us to be. Mental health seminars can be extremely helpful in educating and normalizing the realities of the mental health crisis we're currently experiencing as a culture. I think the other benefit is that it helps the church understand its role in coming alongside those who are suffering from mental health issues. It is important to have a mental health seminar because our wholeness and well-being matter, and we must take care of ourselves. For so long, mental health has been seen as a taboo topic, preventing people from knowing how to care for their whole self well. Seminars are not just about information gathering, but about helping folks to have the practical tools and skills that can be used daily to care for themselves more fully. They also help you build community and be reminded that you are not on this journey of wellness alone. We have three special speakers to stay for you. Each one is especially trained and passionate about helping people with good mental health. Our main speaker is Dr. Earl Bland, and then we also have uh, Sally Kim, who you'll, we will introduce later to you, and then we also have James Hampson, who we we'll introduce later to you, who'll be doing our workshops for us when we have after our first session. So today we'll have three sessions. We'll have our two plenary sessions, and in between them, we'll have our workshops. But our main speaker today is Dr. Earl Bland. And Dr. Bland comes to us from Biola University, but he is a, not only a professor there, uh, but he also serves at the Institute of Contemporary Psychoanalysis and at the Brookhaven Institute for Psychoanalysis and Christian thought. And what's so important to us about inviting Dr. Bland is that he brings an integration between psychology and, psych and psychiatry and our faith and being able to understand that God has made us as whole people. We have a mind, we have emotions, we have a body, we have a soul, we have a spirit. 
And in that, there can be a lot of confusion at times. And so Dr. Bland will bring to us some messages to help us with our theme, which is to learn how to not be so hurried in a world that is so crazy and to find certainty in a place where there's uncertainty and to find peace in places where sometimes it just feels like there's chaos and hurt. And so I'd like to ask Dr. Bland to come forward and to share his messages with us. Would you please uh, warmly greet him with me? Thank you. Is this, uh, are we live? Okay. Greetings and thank you, uh, Curtis and Carol, for your very warm um, invite and uh, reception. This has been um, an interesting, um, trying to get ready for different seminars. I'm, I'm a professor, that's my main gig, um, and I also practice psychotherapy and uh, so I'm, I'm used to sort of a sort of a regular rhythm of teaching. I'm not used to um, sort of speaking without sort of an audience kind of participation kind of thing. I like it when my students talk back to me or at least when they're thinking back with me anyway. Um, so I invite you today to sort of engage in a process of thought. Um, I, um, as all good professors do, sometimes we raise more questions than we provide answers. And I think that that's probably going to be the nature of the talk today. Um, but um, I will say that this is a topic that I've been talking, I've been thinking about for a long time. Um, in fact, it, I, I remember giving a talk in a church about 20 years ago on uncertainty. And uh, it's interesting, the, the sort of the the, the um, activities that have happened since in our world and certainly in my life uh, since I gave that original talk. So what I want to do is to, uh, is to enter into a conversation um, about the experience of uncertainty. And um, I, there's a couple things that, that I want to clarify. Um, when we think about mental health and we think about... Um, the things that we struggle with in our lives, oftentimes we think about very specific kinds of emotions or behaviors or problems that are in relationships. I'm not going to address those specific things. What I want to address in this talk, in these couple of talks, is some of the underlying aspects of what makes us feel certain kinds of ways or why we struggle with the behaviors that we do or the relationship dynamics that we do. And in doing so, we're going to talk about the, uh, I'm going to make sure this works. Um, when I'm, I'm not able to click through, oh, you got one? Wait, did it just work? Okay. Should I tell you or is this going to work now? Oh, okay, great. Okay. Um, so President Biden, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, uh, announced that the pandemic was over. Um, now, this came out with a, a great deal of controversy because at the time he gave this particular announcement, um, until still today, about 450 people a day are dying in America with COVID-related illnesses. And that worldwide, that's around between 1,500 and 2,000. Uh, and so it seems to me that uh, there is a, 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 a continuing level of uncertainty around this sort of uh, pandemic that has uh, disrupted our lives in ways that I'm, I'm actually not sure that we have fully grasped. But that's not the only aspect of uncertainty. We'll talk, we'll, these are the things that are in the backdrop as, we, as, as I do this talk. Um, Ian just roared through Florida um, and into South Carolina. California is headed for its fourth year of drought. It seems as if our political systems have always been sort of a little bit uncertain about who's going to do what, but as we enter into another political cycle, we have the same kinds of conversations that we've been having for a while now, but it seems to be that there's a little bit more unrest or a little bit more uncertainty. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm uh, 
I, I am actually a little glad that I'm not retiring in the next couple of years because of the way the stock market has taken a dive and the uncertainty about whether or not I would have enough money to be able to make it if this happens. Some of you are in that, right? You're in the midst of like, is, when, the, when the market goes down, what, what is happening to my security, my sense of, of will I be able to plan on doing the thing or do the things that I plan on doing? So the stock market is falling, the gas prices are up. There is continued racial and ethnic tension and the violence has increased. And it seems to me that the pandemic has just sort of poured fuel, right, onto these things that we know are always there. Um, but the global instability seems to be ramping itself up. Uh, I, I felt um, the, uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, as incredibly sort of personally, not just because I've been to Eastern Europe, but it's, there's a sense in which it disrupts my sense of what the, what's going on in the world. And it's not just a sense of like sort of identifying with people. It's that the things that happen in Ukraine have a direct impact on our lives now because we are so connected. So it seems that these sort of events in our world are very difficult for us to sort of abstract ourselves from. It has very real consequences in our lives not just through empathy, right? Not just through sort of caring for the people that these things are happening to. And we know that uncertainty occurs, right? Um, in, by the degree to which the thing that is happening is connected or threatens us. So these events in the world that we're talking about, they, they, are, they maybe impact us emotionally uh, in general, but they have real impact to the degree to which they threaten our ongoing sense of being. That's one level of uncertainty. Um, but I want to talk also about a different level of uncertainty, and that's a level of uncertainty that we carry within ourselves. Um, I don't usually quote Jay-Z, but I'm going to quote Jay-Z. And this comes from a, this comes from a book, on the, on the Road with St. Augustine, uh, by James K. Smith, who, who I think uh, put this out as a, as a sort of quote of Jay-Z, and I think that this is an interesting one. Um, that has to do with uncertainty. And Jay-Z's a rapper, if you don't know who he is, but he says, one of the things that makes rap at its best so human is it doesn't force you to pretend to be the only one, excuse me, only, there, to be only one thing or another, to be a saint or a sinner. It recognizes that you can be true to yourself and still have unexpected dimensions and opposing ideas. Having a devil on one shoulder and an angel on the next is the most common thing in the world. Uh, when you act like you don't have contradictions inside of you, that you, are so, that you are so dull and unimaginative that your mind never changes or wanders into strange and unexpected places. So one of the things that I want to do today and this morning is to talk about not just the uncertainties that are going on in the world around us and how we manage those, but the uncertainties that actually live within us and the ways in which we find ourselves in contradictions. It's what Augustine uh, is referring to when he says, I am a burden unto myself. That there are aspects of ourselves that are burdensome to us. Uh, okay, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Okay. So this is our agenda. So I want to talk a little bit about uncertainty, a little bit about fear and anxiety and dread. And then I want to, I want to talk about the sources of our anxiety and our fear and our dread, how we seek certainty and the signs of our avoidance. During the pandemic, my wife and I were uh, doing what many of you did, which is we're holed up and we're making our own food and we uh, decided, to, I decided to learn how to cook. We did a little bit of a diet um, and we almost exhausted our Netflix portfolio. Uh, um, and one of the movies that we watched was a movie that came out, I believe, in 2020, 2021, somewhere in there, called Spontaneous. Spontaneous is a film about um, a bunch of high school kids, and they're in their senior year, and all of a sudden, there, uh, there is a, an epidemic, if you will, of spontaneous combustion. In other words, kids just start to explode in the middle of class, walking down the street, in the middle of conversations, and so on and so forth. And 
in some ways, it's, it's a rather macabre, sort of ridiculous kind of idea, but the way in which the, the director of this particular film was taking it was, what do we do when the world is unpredictable, when things happen that we do not plan? There's a couple, I'll be referring back to this uh, movie uh, because I think it brought out a couple of things. These, these senior kids were, their, their friends were blowing up, but what they were also doing was trying to plan for the prom. And they were still filling out their, uh, their college applications, even though their friends were blowing up around them. They were trying to maintain some sense of normalcy. And I think that one of the things that's really interesting about us as humans is we have a, we have a tolerance for degrees of uncertainty. And oftentimes that tolerance, sort of we, we sort of go through life to try to act as if the world is not as distressing and as upsetting and as crazy as it is. And, and so one of the things that I want to talk about is your own, what we're going to be calling uh, uncertainty tolerance. So I want to ask you a question. Have you thought about the day of your death? How does it feel to sit here and know that tomorrow you might not be alive? No, it's okay. I just want you to think. <laughs> well, you can answer, sure. Um, I, the reason I ask this question is because I actually don't think we do that very much. Right? I think that we... If we are assaulted, if we allow ourselves to be assaulted about the uncertainties that walking out of here, we could get into a, is it the 101? I'm not a, yeah, you get on the 101 and somebody crazy, right, does something, or we fail to do something. We look at our phone. We're not supposed to look at our phones. We look at our phones and something happens and then it is done. The whole discussion here today, for at least from what I'm discussing, is that we often sort of live in a world of certainty to the degree to which we can live apart from or some do something with the uncertainty that is always around us. Now, what's really interesting about this um, is there's an, it's a scientific, it's sort of um, ecological um, uh, um, scientist called Robert Sapolsky. Um, and he wrote a book in 1994 called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And it's a fascinating study. And, and I mean, if you ponder the question, why don't zebras get ulcers? Right? Um, because we would think that a zebra's life is much more fragile than ours. Right? They're sort of living in the savannah, and then they're, they live and then they're eating and they're drinking and they're eating and they're drinking and either they get attacked by a lion, right? And and rather painfully for them or eventually they live to be old and they die. Well, the reason why zebras don't get ulcers is because when they experience uncertainty, it is immediate. They respond to it by running, typically, and then they forget it. So when a zebra wakes up today, it's not thinking about the encounter with the, the running from the lion that they had yesterday. It's also not thinking about the lion that they have to face tomorrow, if they do. What makes zebras not get ulcers is they're not preoccupied by their own stress. They do not have what we as humans have, which is the capacity to think forward and the capacity to remember. Right? So... Oftentimes, we don't, we don't have, we do have episodic stressors that create uncertainty in our lives, but human stress lingers unlike it does for the zebra. We don't know when the next lion will come, but the thing is, we know that the lion is out there and we remember the last time the lion attacked us. So when we're thinking about uncertainty. I believe that uncertainty is linked to much of what ails us. It is linked to our ongoing sense of fragility or our ongoing sense of sort of uh, the ability to sort of face the world with some degree of courage. And there is, there is particularly anxiety 
and stress that we de deal with because of because of the uncertainty in the world that has direct effect on our physical and mental health problems. PTSD, anxiety. Anxiety, it, it sort of, uh, it depends, um, sort of jumps back and forth is the number one sort of mental health struggle for people. Anxiety is typically number one, depression is number two, but they can switch back and forth. What creates this sense of anxiety, sort of the sense of uncertainty too, is the dissonance between what we predict or believe is going to happen and what actually happens. Now, I want to say something here that um, experience does help us here, but I, I do want to say that unpredictability and the discrepancy, this distance, the gap between what we think is going to happen and what actually happens speaks directly to our sense of our own agency, the, directly to our own sense of power in the world. How effective do we feel we are in the world to determine our own outcomes? And it messes with our connections about what follows what. In other words, what's the causal reality? And when I talk about causal reality, if I do A, then B will happen. Now, sometimes we do A and we know that one A, B, or C would happen. But when those things don't happen, it creates a sense of unpredictability. And that unpredictability is the reality in which we are living which has significant impact on our perceptions of the world and our expectancies of the world. We'll talk a little bit more about some of these experiences um, as we go forward. Now, um, I don't know uh, if you are a Forrest Gump fan, but um, you'll remember this statement because it's sort of become in sort of public lore. Mama always said, life was like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. Now, this is a rather sanguine sort of approach, right, to the ways in which we can uh, sort of uh, deal with uncertainty. And in many ways, you, you kind of, I mean, I don't know, do you like chocolates? And are you the type of person that has to look at the sort of little the, before you take it so that you can determine what it is, right? You're not just the person that opens it. Or are you the type of person that opens it, if you don't like it, put it back in, let the next person take it. I'm not sure. But the idea here is, is that what Forrest Gump is going after is that there's some sense of spot, there's some sense of spontaneity in life, some sense in which when life surprises us, right, we have unexpected experiences, that that's a good thing. And I, I would say, absolutely, absolutely. And we need a certain degree of un uncertainty in our lives in order to sort of make them interesting. When everything is the same, right? We get bored and so on and so forth. But unlike the uncertainty that Forrest Gump is having about when the, bus next, the next bus is gonna arrive or how he's gonna to get to Jenny's house or whatever, we realize that there are things that we can control. In fact, we can choose the type of candy that we want. We can control the degree of uncertainty. Life is like a bunch of caramel chocolates, right? If I was to choose them, right? I don't know what yours are, right? So we can, in many ways, try to control the notion of the uncertainty in our lives. Now, again, we're going to have a little bit of, we're going to wrestle a little bit with the whole notion of control as we go through this. Now, Irving Yalom, and I get this from uh, Mark Schaefer, sort of discusses that there are basically four areas of our lives where uncertainty becomes sort of largely problematic. And that has to do with our own death. When will that happen? And what, what do we want to have happen before our own death? The idea of our relationships and the issue around being alone and what does it mean, right, when we're in relationships or we're out of relationships. We spend a lot of our time preoccupied by the connections that we have. If I was to say the one thing that most of my patients are dealing with that is always in common, it's the degree to which they are connected or disconnected, the degree to which people listen to them or don't the relationship that ended or the relationship that is starting, the one they want to end or the one they want to start. These are the preoccupations of our lives. The third one is our ability to make our own choices and decisions. 
and the degree to which the world around us limits our capacity to feel a sense of freedom. Now, we live in a country, right, which prizes the notion of freedom. And so we can think about sort of other places where that freedom may not be as sort of broad that we think about. But I'm also talking about the freedom within, right, the freedom to make our own choices that, are, that really do feel free, the freedom, the freedom to do something or to not do something. Many times when I talk to patients about um, aspects of their life that they want to change, right? It is not some sort of external force that is keeping them from making these choices. It is an internal, right? Where they don't feel they can do a, make a certain decision, go to a certain place, confront a certain person, address a certain kind of memory within them because there is a lack of freedom within. So. The third one is our ability to make our own choices and decisions, not just whether I'm going to go to Starbucks or Pete's, but what's, what I'm going to do with what's going on inside. And the fourth one is a sense of purposefulness or meaningfulness in life. Right? So we can think about if, if, uh, if, there, is, if there is a sort of one thing that we want in our lives, I would imagine at the end is that somehow our lives are meaningful. Maybe they don't have to be sort of globally meaningful, but at least meaningful to us and to the people that we are close to. And when our circumstances rob us of that sense of meaningfulness and purposefulness, then we find ourselves dealing with anxiety and uncertainty. That's, so I'm, I'm wanting to talk about not the types necessarily of uncertainties that we can control. I'm wanting to talk about what Werner Heisenberg, who is the, the father of what he called the uncertainty principle, which we are not going to go into because it has to do with wave particles and uh, whether or not you can actually sort of pinpoint uh, something in a, and once you observe something, it actually changes it and so on and so forth, which is very interesting stuff, but not particularly to a psychologist. What Werner Heisenberg said is, is that uncertainty is not, I don't know. It is, I can't know. I am uncertain does not mean I could be certain. So there is a way in which, right, if you are uncertain about, right, which, um, let's say, which stock portfolio you should put your money in, right? There is information you can get to reduce your uncertainty. If you're uncertain about which car to buy, you can drive a bunch of different cars and figure out one, which one fits you. If you're uncertain about um, whether you should engage in a particular, take a particular job or a particular position or whether you should, should go to this particular thing, you can gain knowledge that will help reduce the gap between what you know and what you don't know, which then reduces our sense of felt uncertainty and our sense of anxiety or what have you. Absolutely. Right? Those are the things, and, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a professor, right? I believe in the uh, sort of accumulation of enough knowledge to be able to operate effectively in the world. But I, I, wanted, I want us to wonder, what are the areas or aspects of our life that are governed by the intractability, the unavoidability of unpredictability? In other words, where, where in life do we live where we just can't know? And then how do we deal with the I just can't know? And I think this goes back to our modern sensibilities, right? The sense in which, right, we have this sort of thing called science. And we have been so infused by the notion, this sort of like shift to science in our world, where we reduce the degree of uncertainty in our lives. I have an app on my phone that actually is pretty good at telling me the exact moment I am going to end up at any given point, even in LA traffic, right? Because it's crowdsourced and I get to know where the police are, I get to know where, you know, ways. You probably use it yourself or something like that. It tells you, exa I, don't, I don't know, actually, I, I don't even know what direction that is that I'm facing right now. Because historically, when I look at map, I would get a general, you know, idea of where things are, but now I just follow this sort of line, blue, right? And I end up at the place I want to be. So it reduces the level of uncertainty, but it also um, creates a level of sort of vulnerability for me if my phone doesn't work. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is, is that in our modern sensibilities, we have, we have 
we try to get into a world that is so certain that it doesn't talk back to us, that we know exactly what the next step is going to be. I know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow or the next day or what have you, so that we're not surprised. Now, Richard Beck, who is a professor of psychology at Abilene Christian, uh, wrote a book recently called Hunting Magic Eels. And in that book, he talks about um, how we have lost in our modern sensibility the capability of being enchanted. Enchanted by mystery. Enchanted by the unknown. Enchanted by the possibility. And enchanted by the mysteries of God and where God is operating in the world. Because we know. And we can figure out. And my discipline, right? has been trying to figure out this thing called mental illness or mental health for a long period of time. And we do know some things, but mostly what my discipline knows how to do is to name something. Mostly. Now, I'm not throwing my discipline under the bus. I like my discipline, right? But mostly, I know what that is. But if you were to ask me what to do about that, well, then we become a, it becomes a much broader question. So I want to I want to say that there are that this uncertainty, by the way, is not just and I'm going to be hinting at this as we go through, particularly in the next session, is, is that this uncertainty that we go through is is not just something that plagues the non-Christian. Luke Timothy Johnson says, and we can point to some verses in the Bible and so on and so forth, um, that we must understand that uncertainty or maybe even ambiguity or realizing uncertainty and ambiguity is not giving way to a sort of like formlessness or a sense of arbitrariness to our lives, but that we inherently realize that there is a level of risk, a level of tentativeness, and of a little bit of gamble maybe that leaves things open-ended and that if we are committed as a church, right, to learning Jesus, then we must be aware of the degree of ambiguity even in that process. And for if you have been a Christian longer than five minutes, right, you realize that there are inherent uncertainties even in our faith that we cherish so deeply. And we have lots of fights about those. We're not going to have them today, but, right? Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about about how that, that sort of engages us, if you will. So when we're thinking about uncertainty, uh, there are three kind of general things that we have a response to uncertainty with. Um, anxiety, fear, and dread. Now, we often use anxiety, fear, and dread interchangeably, but I want to separate them out because I think it's actually useful. So... Fear is the adaptable human capacity to respond to an external threat. So I've never had this kind of a situation face me, right, with the lion. I don't know, maybe you have. Um, my suggestion in response to said threat is probably the same as what you're coming up with, right? Run. Or don't put yourself in that situation in the first place. Right, if they're lions, don't get out of the, you know, the safari vehicle, that sort of thing. When we're talking about uncertainty, we are talking about the fact that there are real things that can hurt us. And we need to take into account the degree to which our uncertainty intolerance might be actually related to real fears. And that these real fears are based on a consensual reality. Right, so we, we are aware, that most of us are aware, right, if we do certain kinds of things, those are inherently dangerous. Right? Now, my guess is you could probably live your whole life and not wear a seatbelt, right? But right, we know that if you get in a car wreck, not wearing a seatbelt is worse than wearing a seatbelt, generally speaking. So we can do things to sort of mitigate against fears. We do things that uh, I recently had... Um, uh, situation where someone I know went to um, swim with alligators. 
right? I thought, A, this is incredibly brave, right? And we, we talked about it, right? And it was, there's a place in Florida you can go and you can swim with alligators, right? And I thought to myself, that hasn't been on my top 10, right? But it was on hers. Now, for her, it was enlivening and engaging, right? It was sort of taking her towards the edge of something that she wanted to be with. And it was, it was wonderful. She had a great experience, right? For me, that's not really what I want to do, right? Some of you have skydived, right? Anybody? Thank you. Okay. Right. No. Right? My brothers, uh, my brothers both went skydiving one time, and then they went bungee jumping a couple of years later, and they said that bungee jumping was actually more frightening than skydiving because of the degree to which the ground rush hit them. When they were way up at a few thousand feet, the ground was way below. But when they were only a few hundred feet up, the ground was right there. They were faced with the, their, own, you know, their own death, if you will. Could it be today? I want, to, I want to say here that there are things to be afraid of. Right now, my colleague, she's um, dealing with um, chemo and uh, radiation following a double mastectomy. She's in her late 30s. She's got two small kids, right? And she's dealing with the cancer diagnosis, breast cancer diagnosis. This is a real thing to be afraid of. So it's not just sort of lions out there, but it's the thing that's, things that can happen to our own bodies. I think of a, uh, a patient of mine who is in law enforcement, and he regularly deals with dangerous situations and people. So his anxiety is not based on some sort of like fancy. His fear is real. Does that make sense? And there are ways in which we can cope with this. And some of you have put yourself into situations where that occurs. Now, this is different, and I use these two... Um, these two uh, paintings, one is a little bit more, um, more well-known, The Scream by Edward Munch and Deep by uh, Navedo, to sort of describe the next sort of uh, idea here, which is anxiety. Now, there is so much anxiety that happens in our current culture that we got a whole list of disorders, right? So if you go to someone like myself or someone, you know, psychiatrist, we can have like, you can have specific things like phobias, right? Um, you can have a social anxiety, you can have obsessive compulsive disorder, which is an anxiety about something that's happened, that you're doing something to overcome the fear so that it takes care of it. You can have an, a separation anxiety disorder, you can have a panic disorder. And then if that's not good enough, you can have a generalized anxiety disorder, which everything kind of makes you anxious. Right? In fact, there's just sort of this low hum, right, of anxiety that just sort of like is with you all the time. Unlike fears, though, anxieties are often not directly tied to specific dangers. So we can't name them. And even if you have a phobia, right, of elevators, of flights, of heights, of snakes, what have you, right? It's not like those things are actually going to provide, sort of harm you in the way that you think you're going, they're going to harm you. So when I'm dealing with uh, I, uh, patients who have different phobias, right? It's not that that particular phobia is not actually going to provide them with any real harm, right? Why would one be afraid of elevators? And the answer to that is because elevators can fall. Right? But I would suggest to you that you have never actually been in an elevator that has sort of plummeted to the ground. Now, in the world of possibility, is that there? Of course it is. But the likelihood of that happening is zero. So the degree to which one is anxious relative to the degree of threat or the degree of risk is out of bounds. This is the nature of anxiety. Is, is that we worry about things that in all likelihood will not happen. I don't know what you woke up with today to worry you, <laughs> right? I have no idea. 
But my guess is, is that if I, you stop right now and you think, okay, just like you were contemplating your death, this one here, right? If you think about what are the things that you are currently worried about, you could sort of pull them up. And some of them have to do with, I don't know where I'm going to eat or I got to get groceries or I don't have enough money for the bills to, I don't know what's going to happen with my children. I don't know what's going to happen with my marriage. I don't know what's going to happen with whatever, right? We have all these kinds of things. And our degree of anxiety is often uh, located with the degree of actual control we have over how we respond to these particular anxieties. Now, I also want to say that anxiety is not just sort of useless, right? Anxiety is often related to, I don't know, how many of you, like, let me show of hands, how many of you are the type of people that um, when you, when you have things to do, you make a list? Okay. And so how many of you, when you have, um, when you make your list, you actually put on there things that you have already done and you cross them off? Right? Now, why do you do that? I'm just, I'm just curious. As a list, as a non-list maker, unless in dire circumstances, right? Why do we cross off those things? like to see all the things I've done. What it is, is it absolutely, it is, it is a way to make us feel better in the face of all the things that we have to do. It is a way to sort of quell the anxiety, right? And that it's fine. We all have these little strategies. I have my strategies. Mostly it's avoidance, and we'll talk about that later, <laughs> right? But we all have ways in which we manage this. But I think there's something else here that's really important. This has to do with our mental health folks. This has to do with the fact that sometimes we get anxious about things because we have experienced things that are dangerous and they are threatening to us, even if they're not currently threatening to us. We have a memory about what happened and we know what could happen. These events shatter right? Our sort of like what Robert Stollero calls the absolutisms of everyday life. The absolutisms of everyday life are the sense in which I ask you, what are you, are you going to come to lunch? Absolutely. Are you going to go to church tomorrow? Absolutely. Are you going to see your, I'm going to see my kids and celebrate a birthday party tonight in downtown LA. And you would ask me, are you going to go see your kids? And I, absolutely. Right. Until right? You and I all know, right? That like that, those absolutes, absolutisms get shattered. Something happens in which the absolute did not occur. And so we realize when we walk into the world, right, that there are things that can happen. My wife Kayla's mother died in a tragic car wreck on December 14th, 1986. Right. She was doing her uh, exams and she called home and was going to talk about coming home for Christmas. And her brother answered, brother-in-law answered, or maybe it was the pastor. It was the pastor. Oh, wait, let me get your brother-in-law. Kayla, your mom was in a car wreck. The ice ran off the road. So all of a sudden the absolutisms get shattered, Right. The absolutism, I'm going to see my mom for Christmas. We're going to have fun. My mom's going to come to my graduation. Absolutely. My mom's going to be at my wedding. Absolutely. My mom's going to be with me when I have my first child. Absolutely. Right? It gets... And these are the things that stay with us, even if they happen a long time ago. Because we're good at this, right? We're good at remembering the things that happen to us. This is what we call traumas. And the traumas that we have, what, thing, what makes things traumatic right, is, is that we have, we struggle to make emotional sense of something, right? And when we can't make emotional sense of something, or there's another ways that make things traumatic when we're not, when we, we're in one of a relational home for it, but those are the things that carry through and keep us anxious. The other thing about anxiety that's important here is, is that the, the discrepancy between what happens and our capacity to make meaning of that. So, this, this is the unintelligible gap. Right? The, the, when things happen to us and they're not supposed to happen, or, or, or we, can, we can think about, oh, well, I can see where it goes, but sometimes you just can't make sense of it. 
right? And we try all kinds of strategies. Well, they had it coming, or they went thinking, or blah, 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 or it was just their time, or what have you. But how do you make sense, right, of things that are unintelligible? And we try to reduce our anxiety by cramming in these kinds of reasons that we all agree, okay, maybe this is the reason why that happened. And by the way, we Christians are very bad at this. Because what we do is that what we did, we, we said, if when nothing else makes sense, we go, well, this is the way God wanted it, or God's still in control, or God still loves us. And all of those things are true, but it's not, it's not meant in that kind of way. It's meant to sort of quell the degree of uncertainty within us. And that's fine. I'm all for it. But let's sort of remember what we're doing. And that, that for some people, that doesn't work, particularly people who are caught right, in that degree of uncertainty. So... My, as you've probably already found out, my, my, my goal here is not to reduce your level of anxiety, um, but to get you to wonder about the sources of your anxiety and how your anxieties are related to managing the uncertainties of your life. So, my, like, my children are 25 six, seven, one's in grad school, one's trying to figure out what to do with a philosophy degree, right? So, um, and there's a lot of uncertainty in their lives. I feel a degree of anxiety about them. But it's not the same anxiety I felt when they were 10, 11, 2, and 3. Because then I had a lot more control. Now, I have anxiety about something I can't do anything about, other than just be there. So one of the things that I want us to think about is, is that these are the way, when we when we step into these places, then I want to I want us to sort of think about what is what are we doing with our uncertainty and how we manage our particular anxiety. Let me um, keep going here. So I've suggested there's a difference between anxiety and fear, and I want to suggest that there's also something third that is important for us to consider, and that has to do with dread. If fear is associated with things that could actually happen, and anxiety with the possible but most often not likely are the things that we can't control, dread involves the vulnerability to a future inevitability. In other words, we dread things that we actually know are going to occur. Death and taxes. I mean, that's the sort of one that we all talk about, right? But I actually think that there's something really interesting about dread, and they've done some fMRI studies about this, and so they put the person into the fMRI, and then they look at the brain, and they have them think about something, right? And so, so they can see where the, the activity in the brain is, and what they have done is when they give a person an anxiety sort of task, certain aspects of the brain light up. And when they give somebody sort of a task that has to do with a future inevitability, there is a different part of the brain that also lights up that has to do with time, right? So dread are those things that we know are going to happen, right? And that we cannot avoid. This is what often I think troubles us because yes, we can avert our attention, we can divert it, we can distract it, we can escape from it momentarily, but dread promises a certitude from which we cannot escape. And I think these are different, right? These are different kinds of things. One of the things that dreads uh, my patients the most, right, is that somehow they will repeat the mistakes that have happened, repeat the traumas that have happened, repeat the losses that have happened in their own lives. So when uh, I have patients who struggle with their own children's lives or their marriages, they don't, what, they're, what they dread is the repetition of what happened to them. We most don't want to enter into those very painful places that have already happened to us. We'll talk more about that as we keep going. So I've talked about this a little bit. By the way, I, it'll be a little bit better in plenary too, I'm, you know, this is, this is kind of bad news maybe. Um, what are the sources of our uncertainty? Well, the sources of our uncertainty, um, I'm just gonna check my time here. 
uh, the sources of our uncertainty have to do with the circumstances of our birth, how we were thrown into the world. So some of you were born into circumstances that were actually better than others, and you had no choice. The unavoidable actions of others, the, uh, the notion that there are areas of our life that have to do that we can control, and there are areas of our life that we have influence on, and there are areas of life that have con we are concerned about. And the degree to which we get lost in those or have difficulty di uh, sort of disentangling those, right? Because sometimes we get all upset about things that we have, we have, there are areas of concern, but we have no influence or we have no control. I already talked about our expiration date. We have sources that are internal. This is what Jay-Z is talking about when he says that we are contradictions unto ourselves. Sometimes we don't know why we're doing a particular kind of thing, why we feel a particular kind of way, why this particular action is happening. We have experiences and meanings of our social location. My brothers and sisters in the black community or people in the Asian community or people in the disabled community or people uh, in other kinds of, of, of um, people of color communities look and experience things in the world that I do not. Different genders experience different kinds of things. When I go to a parking lot at night to get my car, I have a different kind of walk, a different kind of feel than my wife. I just walk through the world differently as a male than my wife does as a female. In other words, our social location, where we are placed in the world, makes us vulnerable to certain kinds of, certain kinds of anxieties and uncertainties. Traumas. I'm going to talk a lot more about traumas when we, when we go to the next one about surrender. But traumas have to do with experiences happening to us that we can't make sense of and where we, there is no relational connection to be able to help make sense of those. The other thing about this that I think is interesting is, is that when we, when we seek certainty, it's often a little bit of a contradiction. And um, I'm going to give you a verse here that I think a, little, a couple passages that I think speak directly to this. In James 4.13, and I probably should have put this up on the slide, but um, it says, Today or tomorrow, uh, now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on a business and make money, why do you, why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. One of the things that I think is fascinating about this, this discussion by James is that he's saying right in the middle of the Christian life, there is this inevitable uncertainty and that we often speak to sort of try to tamp down that uncertainty when in fact, the very nature of life is uncertain. So we plan, we make lists, we anticipate, we scheme, we obsess. And I think that there's a little bit of what the scriptures are talking about is that there is an arrogance if we're not able, that's at play, if we're not able to see into the uncertainty and to our sort of vulnerability to the uncertainties of life. This is our last slide. The many ways we plan to overcome our... Uh, our uncertainty. I, I, um, I told you earlier that I'm an avoider. Um, and so sometimes I don't like to think about things. I'm married to a planner. Um, so we have, you can imagine the sort of discussions that we have. Did you think about that? No, I haven't thought about that. But it's happening in six months, right? That's why I haven't thought about it. But it doesn't have to even be that far away. It could be next week and I haven't thought about it. One of the things that I think happens in terms of avoidance is that we worsen our plight, we believe. Like, do the ways that we deal with uncertainty worsen? Not thinking about or making decisions. We put things off. Do we overplan in ways that constricts freedom and spontaneity? 
can we see the con contextual cues of what's going on? In other words, is there an ability for us to uh, realize that in this situation we can do this and in this situation we can do something different? How do we deal with un un uh, unanticipated disruptions? Is there a lot of anger or contempt? Do we lose our compassion or understanding for others? Do we walk through the world with a degree of rigidity? These are all ways in which we avoid anxiety, right? These are all the ways that we avoid uncertainty. I'm gonna close here with um, sort of a pivot uh, to some Q&A. And then we're gonna also realize that the second plenary, we wanna talk about how do we deal with all of this uncertainty? Okay. So for those who are here, um, you should have a piece of paper inside of your folder that you received when you came in for a Q&A. And if you have any questions that you want to ask Dr. Bland, you can write it and we have usher standing on the outside aisles. Just raise your hand. They'll pick them up and then they'll bring them up here to me. But we do have some online already. And if for those of you who are online, uh, you can use Slido or you can use YouTube and to ask your questions. Uh, Slido would probably be better. Um, we'll get the YouTube later, but uh, Slido will come right away, okay? So the first question that comes um, from our watching audience is, and I like this one, what if anxiety causes more anxiety, or if I worry that I'm anxious, what do I do? Right, so there's this really fascinating study that when you get people when, to deal with uncertainty, if you get people to think about the things that they're uncertain about, it just raises the degree of uncertainty and anxiety. Right, so actually mental attention to the things that make us anxious can often make us more anxious. And which is why we engage in these avoidance kinds of strategies. We put it off and we say, I'll think about that tomorrow, or we give ourselves breaks in the day, I'll only worry about this for a half an hour, or have you any of those kinds of strategies. I actually think that that's a, that there's two things about there. One is, I, I think it's okay to put things off, right? It's, it's okay to not think about something you know is out there. But the other thing about this is, is this becomes chronic, right? In which we find ourselves avoiding and not engaging in something that it, it seems to me there's something else going on, right? If the things that we're worried about means is that we haven't taken time to really think through, right? What we are really anxious about and that we are getting lost in our capacity to try control through doing nothing. Right. So there is a there is a uh, and I'll, I'll repeat this probably next time, but there is a statement. People say, uh, don't just sit there, do something. Right. And I am of the mind where don't just do something, sit there. Because when we sit and we are able to think about these things, we're able to sort of draw out what it is that we're actually anxious about. And sometimes it has less to do with what's in, what's right in front of our eyes. And it's more to do with something else that we need to pay attention to. Excellent, thank you. Um, I think maybe some of us have some uh, issues with other people. And, um, and so there's a, a question here is, um, how do I help others deal with uncertainty that affects my, affects me adversely? They cause me stress. So I'm just gonna speak generally to that because each of these is an individual story, right? Um, I, I, I do think that there is, there is, I mean, and, and again, in context, I, I think that there is the one thing that we have to deal with is why are we getting upset about somebody else's anxiety, right? Why is it that we are, why is it they are worried and why is it that we can't talk to that person about how they are impacting us? Now, again, there are lots of different circumstances, so I'm very loath to give directives. But I think that, that we have to be thinking about our own levels of anxiety and what it is that's distressing in the relationship and what's happening so that when we can figure out maybe how to talk to those individuals or in some cases, how to create distances, right? And I think that's, that's really painful, right? Particularly for, in, for those of us who are in entangled relationships where when we engage these people, 
um, they just, it, it's almost toxic, if you will. Um, and particularly when we feel like we have obligations, right? So if we are a parent or if we are a child or if we are a brother or sister, what have you, these are the relationships I think that sometimes we have to be very delicate in terms of thinking about how much and is there, is there, a, is there a way that we can sort of move away from um, these individuals from sort of being right in our face with the anxiety? This question is very similar, but maybe it'll uh, spawn some different uh, perspectives to help mm -hmm. us. Uh, but it, it's very uh, descriptive. It says, I have a person in my life that has been going through a long child custody battle in the court system for about six years. She always plays the victim and the court and attorneys are all out to get her, her thinking circular. How do I address her when she starts in this negative circular thinking pattern? It is a similar, it is a similar way of thinking. Uh, I, so one of the things that I try to really understand about people that are caught in cycles, right, is, is that there's, there is something about the cycle that is protective. There's something about the cycle that keeps them away from something that is greater that they are afraid of, a greater loss, the repeat of a trauma that has not been worked through or something. So, so one of the ways that I first approach individuals like this is try to think about what, what some in my discipline have called the forward edge of a repetitious cycle, right? It's like, what is the cycle trying to get accomplished for the individual? And sometimes that's not always really clear, right? So I don't, I mean, I don't know what it means for this mother to struggle, right, with its custody, kinds of things. I don't know what, what that means for her to struggle. My guess is, and this is purely off the top of my head, it has something to do with her adequacy as a mother, right? It has something to do with what it means to be a mother and what it means to protect children. So I think if we can have, if we can start with that kind of a perspective, then we can develop a sense of empathy for what might be going on. And when we develop empathy, then I think we know the degree to which we can sort of speak, how to speak into a person's life. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to solve it or, the, or what have you, but then I think it allows you to find the position you want to be in, if that, if that makes sense. So there's, a, there's a, an experience, I think, when people are annoying, right? I mean, now, they could be annoying because this is, this is what you do, right? And you're just trying to stay away from somebody that does what you do, right? I mean, we do a lot of avoiding sometimes of other people because they're too much like the part of ourselves that we don't want to give any credence to. But I think that in most circumstances, we can find a way if we enter in and then start to think about what might be there. This question um, refers to faith. Mm -hmm. And so how do we find, intentionally find, God's love, compassion, goodness, and blessings in our personal trials, crisis, and tragedies? How do we find, read that one again? How do we find, how do we intentionally find God's love, compassion, goodness, and blessings in our personal trials, crisis, and tragedies? Yeah. So, I mean, this is probably, this might be a question more appropriate for you, but for me, um, there are, the first one is, is that we have practices and a history as a people of God that are very important for us to engage in. So what are the rhythms of the faith, right? Regardless of what tradition you have, how does the faith provide you structures to hold your experience of what's going on? Often that has to do with the liturgies of your particular church, prayer, engagement and fellowship, um, the Eucharist, sort of uh, reading the scriptures, those kinds of things, contemplation, um, meditation, those kinds of things. But I think one of the things that's very important is the support. And I, if there's one area that I think oftentimes that we as a spectator church in America, kind of, aren't we more of a spectator church? <laughs> I think we are, um, right? We, as we're not involved in these experiences with people. Trauma and hardship needs a relational home, to quote Robert Stoller again. It needs some sort of connection where people can see us. It needs a witness. Even if there's nothing to do about it, we need these witnesses in our lives. Now, 
many of us, right, have those resources that we can engage in, but some of us are really, our lives are really sort of devoid of that. And that's where I think the church really becomes important in finding those kinds of resources. It's not, it's not a, like a, a, a place to sort of like the church has all the answers. I think we really do ourselves a disservice, right, when we, when we sort of mistakenly think that the Christian life is not filled with uncertainty. I, I think we do sell ourselves a big disservice. And that's not to say that we can't be certain of certain things, right? I think I said that right. But I think that when, when we don't take a position of sort of being able to, how do we walk through this world with uncertainty? That, that I think, is the big task. I like the perspective that you brought about needing one another, because throughout all of our workshops and our seminars, one of the things that we have consistently found and our speakers have shared is that mental health is always stronger in community. And whenever uh, that, that is the uh, common denominator of healing, when they have uh, done research on people who have had mental health problems, uh, they found healing. It was always with some form of community. And so the church is to be that community. Absolutely. The church is to be that community. Absolutely. And when we share our struggles, what we find out is other people might share theirs and we find out we're all quite normal. And uh, that- you Normally know, abnormal. Yeah, yes. yeah. We're all, normal is boring. This is just something that we all struggle with. <laughs> right. Then it doesn't mean that you sit there with your struggles, but you then start to find ways to work with each Absolutely. other to find your way out. Um, I do want to acknowledge, we have two more. Um, I want to acknowledge one uh, which question came a while ago. It said, how, to over, how do I overcome traumatic childhood experiences in your life? So I think that you'll enjoy the workshop that we're going to have. It's going to talk about trauma. And uh, Dr. Bland may speak more about trauma in the second session. We can answer this question at the last Q&A. And then this was a, a comment. I don't know if it's a question. Um, obviously, it's from somebody of um, Asian descent. But it says, Ahem, but we can't talk with someone that triggers our anxiety because we're Asians and our culture does not permit it. Uh, I, I do not want to underestimate this, that there are no go places, right, in certain families and certain cultures, right? There are just no go places. Um, now, first of all, I think uh, Asians do have a way of talking about things that are difficult to talk about. So let's just put that out there, right? It's not that it's not that there's some sort of like something missing in the Asian population or in the black population or in the white population or what have you. But I do think that there are cultural norms that exist, right? That we have to really be sensitive to. Um, and it would be, and, and in the process of change, it is really, really important. And I, I, I really emphasize this of not to come in with sort of a hegemonic, with sort of a power move to say, well, you should do it this way until you understand what's going on in the circumstances of the person's life, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah. And uh, by personal experience, I would say that um, we have to break that stigma and we need to do it with love and with kindness. And so when you have opportunity, do talk about it. Do talk about it. Uh, talk about it if you're a child with your parents, which I had to do. Or if you're a parent and you're struggling with it, talk about it with your spouse. Uh, it, it needs to be addressed or it will continue to be in the same manner, which doesn't bring about the help that we all need. Uh, but of course, it needs to be done in a gentle and um, systematic and slow process. We just don't immediately, you know, blurt out everything, but we are in a place of community and we are in a place of care. And then also finding friends who you can talk to if you can't talk to somebody, um, so talk to your non-Asian friends uh, who will let you, you know, <laughs> get the, who will listen to you and, um, and then, you know, be able to move forward. So we're going to stop here.